Thank you for being here for the Leading Leaders podcast. We are currently in our 2020 Servant Leader Series, and I am here with Caitlin Ashley at the Lee Hilton Law Firm. Now, Lee Hilton PLLC is a firm specifically dedicated to helping people prepare for that eventuality that no one really wants to prepare for at the end of life. What do you do with what you have when you're done? In fact, the, the name of Lee's book is called Who Gets Your Stuff When You Die? which seems a little morbid, but it's not. It's really important to ask that question because if you don't answer it, the answer is anybody. But today we have the chance to talk with one of her specialists who deals in wills and probate and has a great background and expertise to do that. So please help me welcome Caitlin Ashley. Thank you for being here. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Tell me how you ended up here at Lee Hilton. So the biggest reason that I'm with Lee Hilton is because I'm from Denton born and raised. My whole family lives in Denton. When I finished up with law school, I definitely knew that I wanted to come back to Denton. So I looked in that job market, found Lee's office, interviewed, and loved it right away. And how long have you been here? I've been here a little over a year. I started in January of 2019. Well, congratulations for yes. your anniversary past. Yes. That's awesome. And what have you learned in the last year that you thought, there's no way I would have ever experienced that? What have I, I've learned more than I could ever even talk about in one uh, hour podcast video. Um, I've helped over 100 families do probate and guardianship cases, um, more than that with estate planning. So wow. gotten a lot of experience with Lee. Um, she's a great mentor and I've learned a lot. So it's kind of like a baptism by fire, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. So we came in, I did a lot of shadowing with Lee. Um, already had some basics from law school, but I learned on the job and got a lot of great results with my clients. Very good. So where did you go to law school? I went to Texas A&M Law School. Very good. But I can't say that without also saying that I went to UT undergrad, so I'm both a Longhorn <laughs> and an Aggie. So. so when they fight, what do you do? I'm you definitely a Longhorn. Size. Oh, okay. Yeah. Longhorn first. Longhorn first. You yeah. spent more time there too. Absolutely. Probably not more money, but more time. That's true. More <laughs> money in law school, but. Very good. So what law did you intend to do when you went to law school? So I actually always wanted to be a criminal lawyer. So going, so growing. Like criminal defense or criminal prosecutor? Criminal prosecution. Okay. Yeah, I always wanted to be a prosecutor. Um, as a kid, I always wanted to be an attorney. You really only know about what there is is criminal or civil. Right. I didn't think I wanted to do civil. So I wanted to be a prosecutor. Um, and then I quickly changed my mind during law school. Was that the first time you had to get up and debate or was it when you realized the humanity involved in criminal cases? So no, I actually love going to court and doing hearings. I still do that with oh, wow. probate and guardianship cases. So I still get to go to court and go in front of a judge. Um, that's not the part that I didn't like. I just, in, in the criminal system, nobody wins. It's just ah. sad all around. So. I felt like um, I wanted to be in an area where I can help people. My clients are happy. I'm helping them move on with their lives and doing good. And um, it's not the situation where nobody wins. Very good. So what are some of the big win type success stories, things that could have been an absolute train wreck if you hadn't stepped in and done what you do? So like I said, um, I've helped close to 100 families do probate and guardianship in my time with Lee. Um, some of these cases, are it's just it's messy when people don't plan so when people don't have a will and they have minor children they have money that they need their kids to be taken care of but they don't have a will um, so my biggest victories are being able to get those to the hearing get that money secured so that those kids can be cared for um, and do that as fast as i can so that's the biggest win is when we have a messy situation um, and i can get it handled in, in court so do I understand that to mean that a majority of what you do is after the death has occurred, when there wasn't a will to begin with, or when the will was unclear? Is that right? So the majority of what I do is after the death occurred, so probate. Okay. Um, n most of my clients do have wills. Okay, and so there are clients here already? Some of our clients that um, just do wills will come back later to do probate. If we've okay. set up trust, they shouldn't need to probate. So I don't know the numbers, but a lot of my probate clients have wills written from other attorneys ah. or unfortunately written online or written at home. Um, and they're not, napkin. yes, <laughs> which is legal. We learned that in law school, but it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Right. It's like a business plan written that way. Yes. It's great so, to blow your nose. Yeah. <laughs> but at least I can work with a will on a napkin. I can't work when there's no will at all. That makes it much harder right. to do the whole process. 
So have you ever had that, I guess it's the inevitable argument? No, mom said I was supposed to get that. No, dad said I was going to get this. And now they're both gone. There's nobody to argue for you. It's just what you remember and that's never clear. Have you ever oh, experienced that? Absolutely. So that's happened recently actually where somebody said that um, their son was supposed to get a piece of land um, and I asked if that was written in the will. If it's not written in the will, then that's up to the family to decide later. Um, we can do a family settlement agreement or they can talk about that amongst themselves. But what I'm looking for is what's written in the will because that's what the judge is going to order to be the case. So how specific does that need to be? Because I know there are, when you, especially when you think about stuff. I mean, the, in the world of stuff where we have, you know, it, it seems to me just driving, you know, through the countryside in Denton County, every time a new neighborhood crops up right across the street is a storage place. Mm -hmm. And it's because we have so much stuff, we don't know what to do with our stuff. And half of our stuff is garbage you wouldn't even want to buy in a garbage sale, I mean a garage sale. But half of that stuff, the kids look at sentimentally, you are the grandkids and yeah. go, that's what reminds me of that individual now that they're gone. You don't really want all their stuff, you want that thing. So yeah. how specific does a will need to be when it comes to those things? Like, this is probably way before your age, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, but it had Steve Martin, the jerk. And he's walking out the door, he's like, all I need in this life is this ashtray. That's it, just this ashtray. It's a little clay ashtray made by his kids. He's like, that's it, well, and that lamp. I need this ashtray and that lamp. And by the time he gets out the door, he's got like 30 things in his arms. And he's trying to waddle out the door. He's like, this is all I need in life, just these 35 things. It, how often do you see that debate or that argument in probate or in the will? And you're like, well, you could have named that specific right. ashtray. So I don't see that come up too often. Most people, like we all want to believe, most people are good people, nice people, everybody gets along. So if they're ah. gonna fight, we send them to other attorneys because <laughs> we are- If fight about it, this is not our area. It's not our area because we, the way our business model is, is we do flat rate engagement fees. That makes me happy as a lawyer to not have to bill hourly, and it makes the client happy to not have to be billed Because they know what the bill's gonna be. Right, they know what the bill's gonna be, fully expected. They can call me, email me, talk with me in person, all free of charge because it's built in. So that's the way our business model is, and we're happy with that, and our clients are happy with that. If they're gonna fight about it, it's gonna be long, drawn out, and it's gonna be expensive. And ugly. And ugly, and a lot of people say that if you fight in court, the only people that win are the attorneys, not when you're doing flat rate fees. So. We like to keep everybody happy. Of course, there are families that are gonna fight over those sentimental issues, so that's where we plan on the front end. So we need to have their will in place so that it's very clear. So one thing to your question about how specific a will needs to be, it depends on the person and what situation the family is in, but our wills are our basic minimum will, cut dry, 35 pages, about. I get basic worried. Basic minimum will. Basic will. pages. Yeah, because there's a lot of what ifs okay. that we're planning for. So I get worried when I have a client come in that has a two-page will. That worries me when I, they say my husband died or my dad died and they show me a two-page will. Because that means there's something they didn't think of. There's something they didn't think of, there's something that's missing, and there's going to be more work during the probate. Wow. If it's one of our wills, at least I know it's a good will and we're good to go if we need to probate. Now, I, ha I heard Lee tell a story about uh, a particular scenario where someone had passed, but their will was written before a divorce and there was a mm -hmm. previous marriage and, and so there were people involved. And then one of them that she talked about, I think it said something vaguely like, uh, I want these two people to split the house and then the rest goes to so-and-so. But what that technically meant was that the house had to be split twice because it was both in the order and one of the possessions. Right. And so somebody got two, two halves of the house and the other person got half of the half that was left, which doesn't even work mathematically. So how do you, I guess when you get a two page will, that's where you're like, hang on, <laughs> we need to really kind of dig into this a moment and see what's here. Yeah. So that goes back to the probate process and how I do that. So what I need to know first when somebody comes in and tells me that their loved one has passed is what assets are there that the family doesn't have access to. So a common misconception is that you have to probate in Texas. You do not have to probate. So certain things can be done, payable on death beneficiaries, et cetera, that you don't have to probate. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna ask is what assets there are. And does your wife have access to that? Do your kids have access to that? Is their money locked up? If there's money locked up in a bank, then we have to probate. So depending on you know 
the family situation fighting over the house and the division, well, that house might not even be in the estate anymore. So my first question is, what do we have? What stuff do we have when that person died? What do we need to do with it to accomplish the testator's goals? Now, I, I just recently spoke with Hunter, and, and he talked a lot about you know, these business what ifs. Mm -hmm. So have you had to deal with any of those where they kind of cross that line? You have to go to Hunter and go, okay, hold on. <laughs> the, the wife didn't realize when her husband died that she's now a half owner in a business she has no interest in. So yeah. is there anything in place for that? What do you do for that? Have, have you had those kind of encounters? Yeah, absolutely. So I worked with Hunter recently on a probate client that came in, him and his wife owned a business together. And I just wanted Hunter to look over the documents to make sure that the way that I was reading it was correct, which was that if wife died, husband can be in charge of the business, no problem, no probate necessary to take care of that. On the other side, when we have clients that own businesses and they're still living and we're planning, we like to put those inside their living trust. So no matter what, that business is taken care of and all the what ifs are worked out by the trust. Very good. Yeah. So what's the biggest aha moment you've had in serving a client uh, since you've come on board here at, at Lee Hilton? So I think just the relief that I can provide for them when, you know, especially a husband and wife and they thought everything was in order and then one of them passes and they don't have access to a bank account to pay their mortgage or their utilities. Yikes. That's pretty scary. And everybody thinks that if you're married, business easy, as easy. usual. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to do anything because you're married. Unfortunately, that the banks don't care if you're married, if your husband was the only one on the account and you're not on it. So biggest aha moment is being able to get things done quickly, get the mom to be able to pay for the utilities mortgage, pay for the kids school um, in those dire situations. I think my wife and I have, have having dealt with her going through a divorce, my mother being divorced and then widowed, we've seen enough of those silly little things that were like, we will have our both names with both equal power on everything that we have until it legally has another reason not to do that. So every yeah. business account, every personal checking account, every social media account, we have you know, passwords that everybody knows in and out yeah. of, online banking and everything, with one exception, and that was the water bill in the last place we lived. Because when I called them and said, we need to turn it off on this date and change to that, they're like, you don't have authority on the water bill. I'm like, I'm, I'm yeah. paying it. And they're like, we don't care who pays it. She's the only one that can turn it off. And I'm like, okay, that's just dumb, but okay, I'll have her call. Yeah. So we make sure that, you know, that that kind of stuff is there. But I guess a lot of people have never experienced that. Never right. been around it, so they just they don't think that way. He's always handled it. Let him handle it. Yeah, absolutely. So two points about that. So the first being that um, everybody wants husband and wife to be co-owners on everything. They think they have their kids listed as beneficiaries. Everything is good to go. The problem with that is that banks change hands. Ownership happens. People mm -hmm. lose papers. So I always tell my clients, every so often you need to go to the bank and have them print out the paper that shows you are co-owners and these are right. your beneficiaries. That's a good point. Because yeah. it happens a lot. I've had- Put it out, put it in a folder, put it in a fireproof safe. Right, and safe deposit box are the worst with that. I've had husbands and wives, you know, clearly owners on the safe deposit box, but the bank lost it. That's locked. <laughs> we can't get in there. We don't know what's in there, if it's valuable or not. Wow. But, and then the second point about what you said about the water bill and how it's a, it's a bill. So like you said, they'll let anybody pay for it. Huge misconception with property, with houses, is that somehow the taxes and paying the taxes and paying the mortgage is related to who owns the house. So I have a lot of people come in and say, oh, the taxing district already has my name on it, it's taken care of. I like to tell people, they will let anybody sign up yeah. to pay the bill. <laughs> that anybody is a big difference. Yeah, they just yeah. the money. They'll let you pay, but as far as who owns it and who's gonna take money at the end of the day, when the house sells, totally different issue. Well, and, and you could have judgments if you're not keeping any closer idea than that. You could have judgments from a lawsuit from a car that you didn't even know. Right, absolutely. You know, ran up a $3,000 toll bill and you're like, hey. And right. sometimes you don't even hear about those things. They mailed it to an old address, you don't respond, there it is. Yeah, so ownership and who pays the bill can be two different things. Right. Yeah. Very good. So who's your ideal customer? If you're like, you know, if I spent the rest of my time here serving people just like this, what would they be like? So honestly, um, if I'm having a bad day, any consult with any client, all of our clients are really nice people. We have conversations about gardening, about dogs, about their family. It's, it's uplifting when I meet with clients. Um, Is my, that because of your gatekeeper? No, um, I mean, no, all of our clients are good. I mean, very rarely do we have to turn somebody down because we don't think that they're a good fit. Um, and in that case, they're probably not gonna be happy with any attorney. 
Right. Um, but all of our clients are just great people. My favorite clients, connect with them personally, um, but then also they're good communicators. So anything I need, they're gonna shoot me an email, um, call me, they're, they're there to answer the questions so that I can help them move the case along. Because I need help from the clients to do that. Right, and you gotta have that synergy. Absolutely. Gotta be working in the same direction. Absolutely. So, last question. What is your greatest strength that you bring to the table here? So I believe my greatest strength, because I'm a young attorney, you know, like I said, I just started a year ago um, with Lee, graduated law school in 2018. I think my greatest strength is that I've been through this. I've been a probate client. Um, so this is something that we've talked about before at the firm, but it's true that I went through probate when my dad passed when I was 18. I always wanted to be an attorney. My dad wanted me to be an attorney. I, that's always what I wanted to do. I never thought I wanted to do probate. Um, and it kind of just dawned on me when I fell in this position, why did I not want to do this? This is, I've gone through it, I love it. It's a perfect match. I get it. Yeah. So I have that, that balancing effect with the clients that, yes, I'm young, but I've been through this. I've been on this right. side of the table, the same as you. I've gone through this difficult time and I'm here to walk them through it. So I'm there to make it as easy as possible on them. So I think that it gives me a, a level of maturity and respect that most attorneys my age wouldn't get otherwise. When I train leaders and communicators, which is my primary role, I tell them you have to learn to roar. You gotta be relevant, not to you, but to the person you're speaking to and leading. You gotta have ownership, meaning don't come to me with your hypothesis, bring to me what you've done. You've got to have authority, meaning you didn't just do it and get the t-shirt. You've been there, done that, figured it out, and you can teach somebody else how to do it. And you've got to be responsible for how they feel when you're done. You didn't just do this to win, to get a paycheck, to, to, to win the day, so to speak, and, and get another check mark on the win column. You did this because it's right for them. It feels good for them. Yeah. You're in the same boat with them. Absolutely, and I think that that is how our whole firm, um, you know, that's the way that we tackle our clients' business and and matters that we need to help them through. We want to take ownership of it and at the end of the day, keep them happy and make their lives easier. Um, and then that's my probate clients. I think of myself back then going through that and I just want to make it as easy as possible so that they have a good result at the end of the day. Very good. So if you were to speak, and I'm going to actually speak right into the camera there, if you were to speak to someone who is in need of creating a will, but they haven't yet done it, and they're dragging their feet, or they're thinking, I'll do the online thing, or I'll do the prepaid thing, or I'll do the napkin thing. Um, tell them why not. Okay, so why not we're gonna do the, we're not gonna do the, the napkin will, or the online will, or just the no will, because we didn't get around to it. Um, the biggest reason is because we wanna make things easy on our family, right? So we want everything to go smoothly, we want our kids taken care of, we want our property passed the way we want it to, the easiest way to do that is to write a good, valid will. And I say good and valid, and I emphasize that because those online services are not gonna think through all your family um, complexities, what could go wrong, what could happen. They're not state specific. So in Texas, we could have issues if you write an online will that's not valid under Texas law. So it's important to get it done now. Just because you write a will doesn't mean you're gonna die tomorrow. Um, haven't had that happen yet. So. Planning is better than postponing. Very good. Any other things you'd like to say to the crowd before you go? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Caitlin, I appreciate your time. Caitlin, I appreciate your time. And I thank you for being here and answering some questions. And I thank you for watching Leading Leaders Podcast, especially the 2020 Servant Leader Series. And how can they reach out to you? Are, are you on LinkedIn? I am on LinkedIn. So Caitlin, C-A-I-T-L-Y-N, and my last name is Ashley. L-E-Y or L-Y? A-S-H-L-E-Y. Okay. Caitlin Ashley on LinkedIn. Yes. I presume you're on Facebook as well. Yes. Twitter? I'm not on Twitter. Instagram? Yes. And we don't care about TikTok or any of those others. No, oh. I'm too old for that, I think. Well, well I, Gary Vanderchuk is using TikTok now. Can oh, really? <laughs> Insanity. He's really big on Instagram and, and uh, LinkedIn, though, too. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. I appreciate you. you being here.